Welcome to the National Museum, United States Navy. I'm David Barker, an educator here at the museum. James L. Nelson, known as Jim, he is from Maine. He is an author of both fiction and nonfiction books. He has a illustrious career. He has won many awards. Today, James is an author of more than 20 works of maritime fiction and history. His books cover the gaunt of Vikings to piracy in the colonial Americas, the naval action of the American Revolution and the Civil War. This gentleman has given us great books. Jim, thank you very much for joining us. But please tell us about your book. Okay. Okay. All right. Here we go. Well, thanks so much for that uh, that introduction. It's always a pleasure to talk uh, to this uh, audience virtually or in person. Um, in person is always nice, but this works as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my book, George Washington's Secret Navy, and George Washington's introduction to naval affairs at the very beginning of the war. Now, one of the, the issues that you run into when you're writing history, um, because history is so interconnected, there's always a question of what becomes part of the book, what doesn't become part of the book. How do you isolate the particular story that you're going to tell? Uh, I always say that writing history is like cutting into a piece of warm blueberry pie. Um, because you're never quite sure. You cut the pie, you try to make it nice and neat, but geez, some of the innards slide in and out. You're not sure, is this my pie? Is this part of my pie? History is the same thing. You're never quite sure what goes into the story and what doesn't. So I tried to sort of isolate this to look at Washington's early days uh, as a commander and uh, and his introduction, as I said, to naval affairs. Um, I find this part of the American Revolution one of the most interesting uh, parts of that particular period in time. Uh, by the time they were doing this, by the time they were signing the Declaration of Independence, they pretty much knew what the war was about. They had uh, decided that they were going, they were declaring independence. They were fighting to become an independent country by 1776. In 1775, it wasn't nearly that clear. People weren't at all in agreement as to what the war was about. So when you had this, conquered in Lexington, um, it, it was a, a really an ad hoc affair. It was, um, there was, you know, nothing planned about it. No one had decided that we were going to have a battle this day. The British went and marched out in the countryside as they had done regularly. Uh, Thomas Gage in Boston would send his troops marching, you know, around the country in part to get the colonists used to the idea of redcoats marching. Uh, so this one day they finally decide that they're going to go to Concord and Lexington and try to capture leaders of the revolution and the supplies that were there. And this war breaks out. Uh, and again, nobody had planned this. There was no thought that had gone into it. It was an a almost entirely spontaneous affair. And suddenly from this tension that you had, you suddenly have a shooting war and you have this massive army that materializes there outside of Boston, a 15,000 man army that suddenly springs up out of nowhere. And again, with no sort of planning or anything like that, of course, there are hundreds of issues that crop up with this. You know, what are we going to do with this army? Who is, you know, who's going to run it? I mean, all sorts of problems that had not been anticipated. And of course, one of the biggest questions of all was who was going to be in charge of the army? Who was going to be commander in chief? Um, nowadays, most Americans will say, well, of course, it's George Washington. Who else could possibly be in uh, you know, command of the army? And now the choice seems very obvious, but it wasn't quite so obvious then. Of course, now we have this extraordinary mythology that's grown up around Washington, uh, including, you know, the Parson Weems, I cannot tell a lie story and cutting down the cherry tree and all of that. Um, you know, all this, this legend about Washington. Interestingly, um, 
I did a book about Benedict Arnold in the Northern Campaign of 1775-76 called Benedict Arnold's Navy. And you see with Benedict Arnold the exact opposite reaction. After his treason, you had all of this mythology that cropped up about how evil he was as a little boy and how he did all these things to torment other children and uh, lead them into trouble. And, and it's all made up. We, we know virtually nothing about Arnold's childhood in, in the same way that we know very little about George Washington's childhood. But you have this mythology that cr gets created based on who they ultimately ended up uh, becoming. Um, so, so, you know, now you, you have this mythology about Washington. When Washington was finally appointed commander in chief, uh, he gave a speech to the Continental Congress and he said, among other things, I feel great distress from a consciousness that my abilities and military experience may not be equal to the extensive and important trust. You know, basically he's saying, look, I'm, you know, I'm not qualified to do this. In part, I think what Washington is doing here is just what is expected of an 18th century gentleman. You, do, you don't stand up and say, well, of course I'm the guy. You know, you, you're expected to be humble. Um, and, and that's who Washington was. On the other hand, he wasn't wrong insofar as he was not qualified to take command of this army in the field. He had never commanded anything like an army. The largest unit that he'd ever commanded at that point was a regiment. Um, most people would be surprised, actually, to realize that there were two other people uh, who are under consideration for commander in chief? Again, Washington seems so much the obvious choice now that it's hard to imagine that other people were being considered. One of them was Charles Lee, uh, who was a uh, an officer in the regular British Army, uh, had left the army and was now a resident, uh, and had moved to America. Um, very odd looking fellow, as you can see in this picture. Um, ab um, uh, apparently not much given to personal hygiene from reports of the day. Um, but um, uh, he was a very experienced army officer, much more experienced than Washington was. Um, when uh, Charles Lee and um, George Washington visited Abigail Adams uh, on their way to, uh, um, to Boston, Charles Lee was made a major general under uh, Washington, they stopped off and visited Abigail Adams. And Abigail Adams wrote to John Adams uh, about her first impression of George Washington. And she writes, I was struck with General Washington. You had prepared me to entertain a favorable opinion of him, but I thought the half was not told me. Dignity with ease and complacency, the gentleman and the soldier look agreeably blended in him. I mean, she was obviously enamored of the guy and must have driven. John Adams nuts because you know he he was always kind of jealous of Washington and always sort of felt that Washington was the only one that was ever going to be remembered. Once he he sort of peevishly said that Washington was always picked for everything because he was the tallest guy in the room. <laughs> um, but so this is this is Abigail Adams' impression of of, uh, of Washington of Charles Lee. She writes, "The elegance of his pen." far exceeds that of his person. <laughs> so she was not too impressed with Charles Lee. So Lee was one of the people under consideration for commander in chief. The other one was Horatio Gates. And Gates, uh, like Lee, had been a army, uh, an officer in the regular British army, very experienced, had fought in Europe, had, you know, had led large divisions of men, much more experienced at this type of warfare than General Washington was. Um, but the problem is that both of these men were British. And this was one thing that the Continental Congress couldn't get over. Despite their superior um, experience, they were not American born, they were British born. And that was something that the Continental Congress really couldn't get over. This idea of putting someone who's British born in command of the American army. And it turned out to be a very good decision, both Gates and Lee ended the war in various states of disgrace. Um, and they would have been terrible as commander in chief. 
Interestingly, because they were British, and as regular British officers really didn't have much respect for American fighting ability, and you see this throughout the war when they were commanding American troops, they were constantly calling for you know falling back, retreating, because they didn't think in their heart of hearts that Americans could stand up to their beloved redcoats. So they really would have been you know terrible in the role of commander in chief. Uh, luckily, they didn't get it. Washington did. Um, so Washington, you know, he always claimed that he didn't want to be commander in chief, uh, but apparently he went to uh, the Continental Congress wearing his uniform. And we're not even sure exactly what uniform it was. This is uh, a picture shows him in the uniform that he wore when he was a, um, a, a militia officer uh, in Virginia. And, uh, you know, if he was wearing a uniform, if he could still fit in a uniform he hadn't worn for 16 years, that's pretty impressive as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, um, you know, I always felt that Washington was probably sincere in that he did not want to be commander in chief. And the only thing more awful to him would be someone else being commander in chief. So I think there was that sort of subtle... Uh, uh, suggestion, him wearing his uniform in uh, to the Continental Congress. And interesting, this is one of the, the sort of dirty little secrets of writing history, is if you read any biography of Washington, it will say that Washington went to Congress wearing his uniform. And I, I think that's probably true. But there's only one source for it. And that is one letter from John Adams written to Abigail Adams, where he mentions almost offhandedly that Washington wore his uniform to Congress. That's the only source that we have for that. But again, you'll see it in virtually every um, history of uh, the revolution or any biography of George Washington. You know, a lot of this is based on very little uh, in the same way that, you know, everything that I know really about 1776 comes from watching the movie 1776. And uh, one of the things that, surprised me was how much singing and dancing they did uh, at that period. But apparently, based on the movie, that's the way it was. So um, one of the other things that Washington was not very familiar with, um, along with not leading large bodies of men, was the sea. This was something that Washington had never really contended with. Uh, in his career as a soldier, his fighting had been done largely in the wilderness. This is what he was used to. And of course, the most famous battle that he had been in was the Battle of Monongahela uh, during the French and Indian War, when he was accompanying Edward Braddock's column on their way to what's now Pittsburgh. And Washington, you know, as an experienced woodland fighter, kept advising Braddock, this is a really bad idea, marching through the woods with this you know, enormous train of artillery and all the supplies and everything. This is, you're really asking for it. And that's exactly what happened. Um, the uh, Braddock's column was uh, attacked by the French and Indians, uh, ambushed, and the British Redcoats did what Redcoats were trained to do, which was to stand in line with their muskets and, you know, the sign that says, shoot me, written across their chest, and they were shot. Uh, and Washington actually was the one who managed to organize a rear guard and really save the column as it retreated from this ambush. It was a horrible, bloody debacle uh, on the part of the British. And interestingly, that Battle of Monongahela was really a who's who of men who would go on to become important military leaders uh, during the uh, American Revolution. So along with George Washington, Horatio Gates was there, Charles Lee was there, Thomas Gage, who was the uh, commander in chief of British forces in North America at the beginning of the American Revolution, the one who sent the troops to Concord and Lexington. Uh, Daniel Morgan was there, Daniel Boone was there. I mean, it was just an amazing array of figures who would end up being very important um, uh, to the revolution. So anyway, Washington shows up in Boston. Um, 
to take command of this 15,000 man mob. You could hardly call it an army at this point. Um, and what he has to do is lay siege to the city. Now you see in, in this slide, uh, this is a map of Boston circa 1776. And I su suggest that there's no city in the United States that is more physically changed in the past 200 some odd years than Boston. And you can see, when you look at this map, that Boston really is essentially just an island in the middle of this harbor with a little strip of land uh, connecting it to Roxbury um, and, you know, surrounded by water. So the American troops are, you know, completely surrounding Boston on the shore. Uh, and, you know, Washington, his intention is to lay siege to the city, but he recognizes that as long as the sea lanes are open, there's virtually nothing he can do. He can't cut them off because they can always get resupplied by sea. Uh, and he's got no experience with this sort of thing. He has had no experience with naval uh, uh, matters or tactics or considerations. Uh, his only experience with ships really at this point was um, as a young man, he'd taken one voyage in his life to the West Indies where um, happily he contracted uh, a minor case of smallpox um, and he lived through it obviously and it gave him an immunity uh, which you know that right there might have changed the course of american history because here's a disease that so many had died of but washington went into the war with an immunity to smallpox he had actually washington had wanted to be a midshipman in the british navy as a young man and was all ready to go until his uncle convinced his mother that this would be a really, really bad idea. And she pulled the plug on him uh, becoming a midshipman. So Washington had virtually no experience with ships in the sea. And in his mind, when he's thinking about naval might, when he's thinking about a Navy, this is what he has in mind. You know, this is what the British fleet looked like, these massive multi-deck men of war and frigates and brigs and, you know, of, you know, third rate ships of the line, this sort of thing. And Washington recognized that there was absolutely no way the Americans had the resources to go up against this kind of naval might. And he really sort of figured that there wasn't anything that he could do about it. You know, he thought he was stuck because he couldn't mount a Navy to go up against um, uh, the British. So, Luckily for him, there were a lot of men under his command who were very knowledgeable about naval affairs. One of them uh, was John Glover, perhaps the foremost. Uh, Glover was part of the what they call the codfish aristocracy uh, from Marblehead, Massachusetts. He had made uh, a fortune uh, in the cod industry, um, you know, with a bunch of uh, fishing vessels that he owned and, and sent out. He was. Uh, now in command of the 14th Marblehead Militia. Uh, these guys, they were called the web-footed militia. They were, you know, sailors to a man. And whenever Washington, throughout the course of the war, needed uh, people who knew how to handle boats, he would turn to the Marblehead men. So, you know, uh, evacuating the troops off of Long Island after that battle, there were the guys from Marblehead running the boats, crossing the Delaware, there were the guys from Marblehead running the boats. So John Glover, who does understand naval affairs and does understand the, the sea, and we don't know this for sure, but it seems probable because Glover was in Washington's headquarters at the time. Uh, it's probable that Glover was the one who went to Washington and said, look, you don't need big ships of the line. You don't need frigates and all that sort of thing. What we're trying to do is capture unarmed merchant ships. And for that, all you need are a couple of armed schooners. You know, that's all it will take to capture a merchant vessel. And Glover probably said, and, you know, and happily, I happen to have a schooner that I can rent you. <laughs> um, and he did. Uh, he rented Washington the schooner Hannah. Um, and this is one of the real geniuses of George Washington. One of the things that made him the great commander that he was is that he could learn. You know, he didn't have that bullheaded stubbornness that you saw so often in 
the British Army, for instance, you know, the kind of attitude that led uh, Braddock to get, um, you know, ambushed in the woods because he wouldn't listen to anyone. Washington was willing to listen and he was willing to learn. And this is a perfect example of that. Um, when Glover went to Washington and explained what these small schooners could do, Washington got it. And he realized, yeah, you know, we can we can rent these, we can hire these schooners, we can arm them, we can send them out with army personnel and capture these unarmed ships, depriving the British of supplies and bringing very, very valuable supplies to uh, the American army. So as soon as he recognized the potential, he went from feeling there was nothing he could do uh, as far as naval affairs went, to being very, very eager to get these ships out to sea. So the Hannah was fitted out. Um, it was put under the command of a fellow named Nicholas Broughton uh, from Marblehead, uh, who was not, unfortunately, the best choice of commander, as it turned out. Um, but and the Hannah was sent out, uh, you know, to patrol the waters around Boston. But at the same time, Washington sent Glover and another fellow named Stephen Moylan, who was the muster master general of the army, sent them out to Marblehead and Plymouth and Beverly to see what other vessels that were there that he could start chartering and arming and sending out. When he recognized how valuable this could be, he was very, very eager to do it. And so you had kind of a, an interesting situation. Um, most of the captains and crew were from Marblehead, and a lot of the vessels that were chartered were chartered out of Marblehead. Um, so you see, uh, here's you know the Marblehead with their sign, birthplace of the American Navy. Um, <clears throat> but the problem is that if, if for folks who are familiar with the geography of Massachusetts, Marblehead is a very exposed harbor. It's not very safe. It's really open to attack uh, by the British Navy. So they took the ships and they moved them to Beverly, which was much more difficult to access and much more protected from the British Navy. So you see here's Beverly with their sign claiming to be the birthplace of the American Navy. Um, so the two of them have been, you know, sort of fighting about this for uh, well, well over 200 years. Um, in fact, here's here's another one. This is Whitehall in New York, which also claims to be the birthplace of the American Navy. If you go there, you'll see a big sign that says, you know, Whitehall, birthplace of the American Navy. And you'll see this sign that talks about Benedict Arnold's fleet of 1776. And I never understood that because, you know, the, the American, the 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 United States Navy dates its birth date to October 13th of 1775. By 1776, they were already born and a year old. How could that Whitehall claim to be the birthplace of the American Navy? And finally, it was explained to me that, in fact, in 1775, May of 1775, when Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen captured Ticonderoga, they also captured a small schooner in Whitehall and armed it and sent it out on the lake. And the claim is that that was the first armed vessel ever in service of what would become the United States, making Whitehall the birthplace of the American Navy. Uh, and the funny thing is, as you can see from the sign on the screen, even in Whitehall, they don't know why they call themselves the birthplace of the American Navy. You know, but it had nothing to do with Arnold's fleet in 1776. It was that schooner. Anyway, I digress. Um so Washington has put his little fleet together. He sent them out to attack British shipping coming into Boston. Meanwhile, back in Congress, they're still debating on any number of things they're debating. They had so much dumped on their plate when they got back. You know, when they adjourned, uh, the first time on the Congress adjourned, they essentially sent a letter to King George saying, you know, can we all be friends? And when they come back, into session, suddenly this, the war has broken out and they've got an army on their hands and they've got Fort Ticonderoga that's just been captured. So they had a lot on their plate. But one of the things that they were debating was the creation of a Navy. Uh, and this is something that was a very, very hot topic. Rhode Island was the first state to propose the creation of a Navy. Now, 
Rhode Island had been fighting a naval battle, you know, a, a naval war for 10 years before anyone else even knew there was a war going on. This is old hat uh, in, in Rhode Island. Now, all of these um, colonies had been in, involved in smuggling in one way or another. But in Rhode Island, it was an art form. Uh, Rhode Island was based their economy on smuggling, you know, smuggling molasses in from the West Indies, you know, all uh, primarily. Uh, this is a major part of the Rhode Island economy. So for 10 years, the British would send a ship in to Rhode Island uh, to stop the smuggling. The Rhode Islanders would drive it off in some way or another, and the British would send another ship in. And this has been going around and around. Finally, in 1772, uh, the British uh, Navy sent in the schooner Gatsby, um, which was under the command of a fellow named Duddingston, who was a very efficient commander and actually was putting a real hurt on the smuggling activities in Rhode Island. Uh, the folks from Providence and Bristol, when the, uh, um, uh, the schooner uh, Gatsby ran aground, they rode out, attacked it, lit it on fire, burnt it to the waterline. Um, so in response, the British Navy sent Russell Crowe. No, actually, they did not send Russell Crowe. They sent uh, the ship that you see behind him in this picture is a replica of the HMS Rose, which is a frigate, a uh, British frigate. That was uh, another picture of the replica of the Rose. Uh, they sent this ship to Rhode Island uh, to put a stop to smuggling. Now, the Rhode Islanders were not about to burn this to the waterline. This was a pretty serious man of war, and it really did quite effectively stop smuggling. Um, so, you know, the, the uh, representatives to the Continental Congress from Rhode Island were incensed by this, and they proposed the creation of a Navy to drive the Rose off, essentially to protect their smuggling operations. Um, and, uh, yeah, I suppose they had other uh, ideas in mind as well. Uh, the rest of the Congress was very skeptical about the idea of creating a Navy for a number of reasons. Um, one of them, of course, is that a Navy is very, very expensive. Um, you know, if you're fielding an army, particularly in, you know, the 18th century, they can go out with not too much. You see this picture here, um, you know, this is sort of what the Continental Army often looked like, and they were just in tatters, you know, but they can, uh, you know, they can forage for food. Water's not generally an issue. Uh, they can find shelter. You know, a, an army can sort of live off the land. A ship can't do that. A ship pretty much has to have everything on board before it sails. It's got to have the food, the water, firewood. It's got to have, you know, the weapons, the gunpowder, the ammunition. All of this has got to be on board, the spare sails. It's a very, very expensive proposition. You can see here, you know, just how complicated a ship is. It's the most complicated thing you know, built by man, really, at that time. Uh, so it was a very, very expensive thing to send a ship to sea. So that was one of the things that the Continental Congress was not interested in. Um, some people argued that um, the system of prize money by which uh, when a naval vessel captured another ship, um, everyone on the crew got a cut of the take basically uh, is sort of an incentive that was used in every Navy in the world at the time. Um, uh, some people felt that the system of prize money was going to destroy the morals of the sailors, but sailors have never ever really sort of been known as the most upstanding of citizens. So probably that wasn't really much of an argument. Um, one a, a lot of opposition to the Navy came from the Southern colonies because the Southern colonies recognized that they were going to be bearing, you know, their portion of the expense, but this Navy was going to be built by Northerners and it was going to be commanded and crewed by Northerners and it was mostly going to be protecting Northern interests. So they weren't all that interested. Uh, there are a few exceptions. William Henry Lee of Virginia was a big supporter of the Navy, as was 
Christopher Gadsden of South Carolina was also a major supporter of the Navy. He created uh, the Gadsden flag, the now famous Gadsden flag, uh, and he had created that as a as naval ensign. Uh, so he was a big supporter of the uh, the Navy as well. But most of the Southern colonies were very much opposed to the creation of a Navy. Um, but there was another reason that the Congress wasn't interested in creating a Navy in 1775, and it was a little more subtle than that. Creating a Navy is really a tacit admission that independence is the goal here. Um, you know, there had always been a militia. See, here is the, the militia in Jamestown. You know, every community had a militia for self-protection. Um, and and some, a lot of the colonies actually even had small navies for self-protection. They were um, essentially a seaborne version of the militia. You can see here is a replica of the Providence, which was uh, a vessel that was in the Rhode Island Navy before it became part of the Continental Navy. Again, it was a defensive weapon, just like the militia was. Um, the colonies could defend themselves, but only a sovereign nation actually creates a navy and sends it out on the high seas to attack the enemy. That's really something that a sovereign nation does, not a colony that's just trying to defend its rights. And in 1775, they hadn't taken that step yet. They were not ready to actually declare independence. And creating a navy and sending it out would have been a real step in that direction. And they weren't ready to do that. Washington knew this. And he knew that there was an awful lot of resistance to the idea of creating a navy. So when he sent his little fleet, created his little fleet and sent it out, he didn't tell Congress about it. Now, there's no sort of smoking gun letter where he admits that he had done this and was purposely hiding it. But you can really see it between the lines in his correspondence. Washington was very, very good about reporting everything to Congress. And when you look at the reports that he submitted, I mean, they went on for pages and pages and pages. And he would you know, report even the minutest details, disciplinary actions against you know, men that he had taken. Every little thing gets reported to Congress, but he never mentions the ships that he had been that he had armed and sat out on the high seas. Um, and this goes on for months, where he is actively arming ships and sending them out and not mentioning it at all to Congress. So, you know, the one of the questions is: Did Washington actually have the authority to do this? Was he exceeding his own authority? by creating this Navy. Still a, a point that could be debated. In Washington's instructions from the Continental Congress, the Congress wisely understood that they couldn't micromanage everything, which is very unusual for Congress to, to have that realization. But they said to Washington, as part of his instructions, whereas all particulars cannot be foreseen nor positive instructions for such emergencies so beforehand given, but that many things must be left to your prudent and discreet management as occurrences may arise upon the place or from time to time fall out. You are therefore upon such accidents or any occasion that may happen to use your best circumspection. Basically, they're telling Washington, look, when stuff comes up that we haven't specifically told you about, use your best judgment. And that really is what Washington does. Washington sort of relies on that clause in his instructions to take money from his war chest and use it to send the ships out on the high seas. And he continued to do that, and he continued to not tell Congress about what he was doing until finally, after a number of months, uh, his fleet was becoming so successful and taking in so many prizes that Washington couldn't handle them anymore. I mean, he basically needed Congress to step in and create a, a court of admiralty 
that could adjudicate these prizes and decide which were legitimate and which weren't. He basically became a victim of his own success uh, where he had to uh, admit what he was doing. Um, now, one of the things about Washington, he was a very lucky guy. And you see this throughout his career, throughout his life. And this is another perfect example of that. About the time, the fall of 1775, when Washington is recognizing that he's going to have to tell Congress what he's doing, Congress got report of two um, uh, ships, two brigs, from England bound to Quebec loaded with military supplies. And this was a real, real valuable prize. These were exactly you know, the kind of military stores that the uh, Continental Army was desperate for. So it brought up the question again of whether or not they were going to create a Navy. And after some debate, Congress voted to create to arm a couple of vessels and send them out on the high seas after these North Country brigs. And that was what is now considered the birth of the American Navy, when they made that conscious decision that we are going to arm vessels under the flag of the Continental Congress and send them out. Uh, to see. And they wrote to Washington and they said, we would like you to arm some vessels and send them out after these ships. Washington had just written to Congress telling them what he had done, that he had been arming vessels all along. Their letters literally crossed in the mail. So by the time Washington is ready to uh, fess up to what he had done, Congress already decided that that was what they wanted to do. So Washington ends up looking like the most, you know, a prescient possible commander in chief, a very, very lucky man. And that was how the American Revolution went to sea. So thank you very much, folks. Hey, I, I've got to say, I'm very impressed. I, I like the way you tied it all together.